Welcome to our press conference here at the 50th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Great to uh, welcome all of you who are here in the room at this press conference and of course everybody streaming uh, and watching us live online. Thank you for tuning in to what is a very special uh, and major commitment and announcement this morning. Uh, and we have an esteemed an incredible panel to talk you through a very crucial issue that's well in the news today um, as we look at uh, health pandemics and epidemics across the world. And as I said, we are making a major announcement and talking about a critical issue that affects populations everywhere. So this is our press conference on global pandemics, the critical role of frontline health workers in the context of ongoing and emerging outbreaks. Uh, my name is Katie Clift. I will be moderating this press conference this morning. And really what we're focusing in on is, as I said, this issue of global pandemics, but the role of frontline health workers. Not only the fact that we need more of them on the ground as epidemics break out around the world, but how we support these frontline health workers. It is critical that we need more of them, and it is critical that they are well supported with their well-being and resources and different policies. We know that the World Health Organization, just to give you some background, has projected a shortage of more than 18 million frontline health workers by 2030. There are quality crises in low uh, and middle income country health systems. We know this very well. Um, but this panel here today is to talk about what we're going to do about it in the coming years. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you our panel. We have Paul Stoffels, the Executive Vice Chairman and Chief Scientific Officer at Johnson & Johnson. David Miliband, the President and CEO of International Rescue Committee. Uh, Richard Hatchett, the President and CEO of CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which was launched here at the World Economic Forum and Seema Kumar, who is also representing Johnson & Johnson. So again, thank you for being here, a very important topic, uh, especially, I guess, as we are seeing the news today, not only the Ebola outbreak continuing to emerge, uh, but coronavirus. And as we go to air with this press conference, we know that it hasn't yet been declared a public health emergency, but certainly a very uh, timely topic for us to be discussing. So I will refer first to Paul, um, who'll make an opening statement for our press conference. Thank you, Paul. Well, uh, good morning and thank you for joining. Um, as you know, unfortunately, the world is back into a crisis and hopefully it can be limited to uh, a certain region and get quickly under control. Uh, but if not, a very significant measure will need to be taken. And Richard is very much better placed than I and um, um, Mr. Milliman to talk about that. Um, but it's always, uh, if you talk about crisis in the world or whether it is the the healthcare situation very much it's depending on the the healthcare system and uh, the strength of the healthcare system to be able to cope in the front line with the challenges the health, the frontline healthcare workers the nurses uh, um, in the hospitals the midwives the people the doctors who are in the hospitals are always the first to be confronted with the challenges and it's so so important that besides uh, having a, um, preparedness for pandemics and epidemics and and significant diseases that at a, in parallel the um, the healthcare system are strengthened we have been involved in Ebola for a long time we have done research we have a big vaccine in the making and uh, being tested now large scale in Rwanda and Congo uh, or implemented in Rwanda and Congo, uh, 500,000 people will be vaccinated in Congo, 200,000 in Rwanda. Um, but it's only um, after significantly long research and development that we were able to do that. Uh, we work there in the front line with healthcare workers and you see how important it is. If you go back to the region, to, for, um, to the Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea epidemic in 2014, it were first the healthcare workers who bear the victim of, of the disease. They were also the multipliers of the disease because they got infected, brought it over to their um, um, to the families and, and to the healthcare system. And that's why it is so important that healthcare systems are strengthened um, and, and the um, and people are trained, yeah. But it's also for other diseases, whether it's mental health, whether it is infectious, other infectious diseases. Healthcare workers are always in the center, and it's to that regard that we as J and J, it's not that we are already since long time in the trenches to strengthen the healthcare worker systems, and we uh, we will commit and we are committing to do an additional investment of 250 million dollars for the next 10 years to train one uh, one million healthcare workers, reaching 100 million people. And as a private sector, we can make new products, but we also have a responsibility for helping uh, and, and, uh, and training the necessary 
capacity to be able to implement. And whether that's, we are with a significant focus on midwives, uh, health, healthy birth, and making sure that uh, young, young lives are saved, but also the main system of healthcare, primary healthcare workers, mental health, and strengthening the capacity for uh, training in pan pandemics. Johnson & Johnson is a, one of the largest, if not the largest healthcare company in the world. We have a history uh, training uh, nurses and supporting nurses in the US for their entire existence. And uh, we are, as a company, very committed to the primary healthcare system and training healthcare workers. Excellent. Thank you very much for that um, announcement. As you see, it, an incredible investment, uh, particularly focusing on those community health workers, the people really at the front line of these crises. Um, and wonderful to see such an investment, not only in, in providing more workers there, but supporting them as they do what they do. So thank you very much um, for being here and, and for the announcement. David, we'll turn to you. I know that your company has dealt with some of the world's worst humanitarian crises. Um, you've seen this on the ground across the world. Uh, in, in light of these comments, this investment, I mean, the, the topics that are going around the news today, what's your experience? What have you seen? Um, what can you tell us about, I guess, how frontline workers, health workers, what, what they do experience in these situations? Well, thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, maybe I should just explain we're not a company. We're a non-governmental organisation, so a, tra uh, a charity, a non-profit organisation originally founded by Albert Einstein to help refugees come to America. Now we're an international humanitarian aid organization as well as a refugee resettlement agency. We work with some of the what are called the hardest to reach people in the world. We think we helped about 20 million people through our health care services. And I want to just say two things really. One is that our partnership with Johnson & Johnson has been born of real trust building as we've worked together over many years. Currently, we're working in Colombia together and in Jordan, really delivering some important healthcare initiatives. But the second thing goes to the heart of this announcement. Uh, as I said, the people that we help are often called hard to reach patients, hard to reach people. And I want to put to you that that is a complete misnomer. Actually, these are people who are living in areas where there are hard to reach services. The problem is not the people. The problem is the lack of services. And the attraction for us of the announcement of the commitment to frontline healthcare workers is what we mean by frontline. Because what Johnson & Johnson and we mean is community health workers. In other words, not simply resting on the official healthcare system, but actually recognizing that people in a community are the essential frontline and taking healthcare to people is actually a far more efficient and effective way of helping them than expecting them to get the health work, uh, healthcare system. Nowhere is that more important than in some of the most fragile and war-torn contexts where we work. South Sudan, Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan. In South Sudan, we know it can be three hours trek for any patient to get to a healthcare center. But a community health worker who's trained properly, even if they don't have a medical training themselves, has been shown to have outsized impact uh, we know that when it comes to treating malaria, when it comes to treating diarrhea, when it comes to treating pneumonia, healthcare workers have proven their worth. We employ about 13,000 community healthcare workers around the world. These are people drawn from the local community, given some training. And so when it comes to something like Ebola, we know that the biggest barrier to effective Ebola treatment, with the greatest of respect to the medical uh, experts on the panel, the greatest barrier is actually community trust. It's the fear of engagement with the healthcare system. We learned that in West Africa. We're seeing that in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Eastern DRC uh, at the moment. And thinking forward, I think the power of this announcement today is not just about the horror or the fear of pandemics, important though that is. There are also uh, wider agendas, for example, in respect of the treatment of acute malnutrition. We know that half of all under five deaths in the world at the moment are related to malnutrition, either directly or indirectly related to acute malnutrition. We're convinced that community health workers have as big a role in helping to treat, diagnose and treat acute malnutrition as they've had in respect of malaria, uh, diarrhea uh, and uh, pneumonia. In fact, we've published studies uh, that have shown how community health workers, um, using community health workers, has no worse impact on the patient than using a trained uh, nurse or uh, doctor, because the essential diagnosis 
of acute malnutrition is actually relatively simple, not uh, very difficult, and treatment is relatively simple uh, as well. So we're looking forward to uh, this $250 million. It's a baseline, not the whole uh, answer. We hope that other parts of the industry will join. And we hope, above all, that we'll embrace this idea that it's actually people who are living amidst disease that are the first responders to coping with disease. And the more we can train them and equip them and capacitate them to make a difference, the more we'll prevent and uh, have impact in the future. Just Thank quickly, you when you talk about training and you talk about these people in especially fragile and uh, you know low low to middle income countries too, do you do you look at the well being of these people? I mean, that must be a part of it. The fact that um, you know they're there at the front line, they have to deal with some very difficult situations. Yes, I mean, I'd say two things about that. One, um, our experience shows that illiterate and innumerate people can still become healthcare workers. Uh, as long as the training doesn't depend on them being able to read or count. So we've developed a diagnostic tool for diagnosing acute, severe, acute, severe and moderate acute malnutrition that involves no numbers and no letters, only colours. And uh, it's been shown to have no detrimental impact on their capacity to, to, to work. Secondly, of course we have to think about the people on the front line. So, if, so our Ebola workers, community health care workers, they're the first in line for a vaccine, in our view, when it comes to a, an Ebola vaccine. So yes, there are big duty of what we would call in our sector duty of care responsibilities that we have uh, towards our frontline health care staff. But remember, since they're living amidst the affected population, they've got the greatest interest in being the most effective because they know it's their future and it's their own families who are surrounding them. Absolutely, and they're incredible people that, that do this work. Um, Richard, I guess, let's bring you in on, on this issue. I, I mean, we talk about CEPI. We talked about the fact that it was, uh, you know, founded here at the World Economic Forum. You've done incredible work. Um, how do you see this issue and, and what's your experience? Well, so uh, I, CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. We were set up to develop vaccines against some of the greatest global health security threats, and, and we do that by developing the vaccines. Um, in, in terms of, of listening to the discussion about frontline workers, we work on medical technology, and I think there's an important integration of the medical technology with the protection and training of frontline workers. And so you can think about Johnson & Johnson's you know, very commendable investment in training of frontline workers, but you should also think about the investments that Johnson & Johnson and other companies have made to develop products to protect those workers. I. Um, worked in Gabon back in the 1990s on Ebola in an area where there had been multiple outbreaks. And I remember talking to people in Gabon at the time about uh, the outbreaks and you know, what people did during the outbreaks. And they, you talked to them about the, the hospitals. There was a hospital in Makoku and a hospital in Bue where, where Ebola patients were treated. And, but they, many people who got Ebola didn't come into the hospitals. And you ask them, well, why didn't you go to the hospital? And they're like, well, people who go to the hospital die. And part of the reason they died was because there was very little that you could do for you. All you could do was collect people and isolate them and let the course of the illness play out. The other problem, and, and, and you can imagine when you don't have these medical technologies available, um, both Ebola and the current novel coronavirus and many of the other scary diseases that we work on have been associated with healthcare worker infections. And if you have healthcare workers who are facing lethal diseases and are not adequately trained, not adequately protected, and who don't have access to, to products like vaccines that can guarantee their safety, mm. many of them will not come in to work and they will not treat people. And then you have a loss of trust as, as, as David described. So I, th I think the, um, you know, the, this investment in, in training of frontline workers and in thinking about health security threats while doing that and in helping them to prepare for pandemic and epidemics that pandemics and epidemics that may happen in the future is is tremendously important. I'll, I'll just say a, a quick word uh, about our partnership with Johnson and Johnson. I was I was actually just in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda over the weekend before Davos and uh, was have, been, have had the opportunity to visit the vaccination sites on both sides of the border. I learned something that I didn't know, um, which is that the Rwanda-Congo border apparently is supposed to be the, the second busiest border in the world. 50 to 60,000 people a day crossing that border going back and forth. And, and in a setting where you have an Ebola outbreak on one side of the border and people coming back and potentially getting ill and potentially going 
to seek treatment in a different country on the other side of the border where there's not known to be an outbreak, you can imagine the anxiety that that would produce mm -hmm. in the healthcare workers. So Johnson & Johnson's efforts to develop a prophylactic vaccine for Ebola are at, at great expense to the company, and but also with a great deal of, of public sector support, um, you know, could be critically important because it is a vaccine that was designed to be provided to people in advance to protect them from Ebola infection. And what we have seen over the last 40 years, not only with Ebola, but with other diseases like Nipah, like Lhasa, um, like the coronaviruses, uh, this is the third coronavirus that we faced, is a gradual expansion of the geographic range of the virus. And so Ebola was first found in northern DRC in 1976, and it has now spread all across Central Africa. It has spread all into West Africa, of course. And you potentially have, and I, I don't know the numbers to be honest, but I would guess at least hundreds of thousands, if not millions of healthcare workers, you know, at risk for potential exposure to Ebola. Paul, I know that you um, have to leave the panel before we get into a Q&A. Do you have final remarks um, on this announcement, some of the comments you've heard today? I just want to uh, follow on what uh, Richard was saying. Uh, protecting the healthcare workers to get the trust from the healthcare workers that they continue to operate in the healthcare system, not being at risk to be infected, is one of the most critical uh, things to get an epidemic under control. And I'm so gra grateful to the governments of Rwanda, but also to Congo, that now they enable uh, the whole population in the region, especially first the healthcare workers, being able to vaccinate it. And hopefully, we will can we can. Va we we can follow up the patients, the, not the patients, the healthcare workers for a very long time because they are a population which is which is working in the healthcare system and enables us to learn how long they will be protected. And we are, uh, we are in, the intention is to be there uh, three, five, ten years from now and still continue to evaluate what's happening and eventually even boost. If there is a boost necessary after five or ten years, we would be ready to make sure people get continuous protection lifelong. That's the ultimate goal. That's what we are working on. With the science and in collaboration with the governments, we hope we can protect at least the healthcare workers, if not a broader population going forward. Excellent. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Very critical work. We will um, open to see if there are any questions in the room. Uh, we do have a few minutes left, so um, we'll bring the microphone down. Just uh, please state your name and, and where you're from. Um, hi, my name is Gunilla von Heil. I'm a Swedish journalist for Swedish daily Svenska Dagbladet. I have a question on the coronavirus, or several questions. How, and to all of you, but especially Mr. Miliband, how, how serious do you think, how worried are you about the situation with the coronavirus? And how effective do you think it is to now close off cities like they're trying to do in China? Is this an efficient way of dealing with it? Uh, and what risks do you see for health workers in dealing with this epidemic? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, I'm very flattered that you should think I am the right person to answer that question, but I can <laughs> absolutely assure you I'm not the right person to answer that uh, question. I'm neither a uh, epidemiologist nor a medic, nor do we have operations in uh, China. So I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but I hope you haven't, don't think I've come here under false pretenses, but I, uh, I promise you I'm not being falsely modest when I say that the other members of the panel are much better suited to answer it than me. Sure. Yeah, Richard. So, um, no, no, uh, thank you for the question. I mean, I, th I think the first thing to underscore in answering your question is how much we still do not know about the novel coronavirus that has emerged. We, we don't understand its transmission dynamics. We don't understand the, completely understand the epidemiology. We don't have any information yet, to my knowledge, about the, the viral shedding from people that are infected, which will determine their infectiousness. And we don't understand when in the course of their illness they are most infectious. All of those pieces of information are going to be critical to making an informed assessment about exactly how dangerous this virus is and um, exactly what we need to do to control it. Um, if the virus behaves more like influenza, where you have a wide spectrum of illness and you have some people who may be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic but potentially infectious, it will be extraordinarily difficult to control. Influenza cannot be controlled completely, even by the most aggressive application of what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, including travel restrictions. And travel restrictions and border restrictions have been shown to be almost useless for influenza. So I, I think we have to be very guarded in estimating the potential efficacy of stopping transmission. I think the measures that China 
has put in place. I'm not, I don't have enough information to sit in judgment of those interventions. I do anticipate that it will cause a great deal of anxiety in the communities affected. I also anticipate that it will likely slow transmission and it will likely buy some time, but it won't buy large amounts of time and it will be very, very difficult to maintain for more than a few days or a few weeks. So the concern about, the other thing, the other really important, and I hope I'm not getting overly subtle here, but the other thing that makes it very difficult to assess the situation currently is that people who become ill with a, a novel virus don't die as soon as they become sick. They get, they, they have a course of illness, they get sicker and sicker, they go to the hospital, they get sicker in the hospital, they're in, brought into intensive care units, they're treated aggressively for as long as possible and then they perish. And that can sometimes be hospital courses of two or three weeks. And if you're in the phase of an epidemic where the number of cases is increasing exponentially very rapidly, it's very hard to know what the deaths that you see today, what that actually represents, because it really reflects the, the course of the epidemic several weeks in the past, and you don't know how many cases were in the past, so you don't know the lethality. In, in 2009, during the H1N1 pandemic, we knew from late April that we were going to be facing a pandemic, and we did not have an accurate estimate of the lethality until August. And, 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 and we are likely to be in a similar situation with this epidemic. So my anxiety level about this virus is actually very high. And I think it needs to be taken with the utmost seriousness and global public health authorities have responded very aggressively, very appropriately, um, working in close conjunction with WHO who is providing great leadership and trying to make very responsible decisions and working with the Chinese authorities. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in our final few minutes? Oh, yeah. Oliver Varney from Al Jazeera. Um, just following up on that, um, you're talking about the difficulty of getting frontline healthcare workers to even come into work unless they have the correct provisions in terms of training or in the case of Ebola, vaccination. When it comes to something like the coronavirus where there's, it's still a bit of a mystery, how much harder does that make getting frontline healthcare workers to come in and, and, and avoid the panic, I guess. Well, I'm, I, I, like David, I'm going to disclaim being an authority, and, and, and David may be in a better position to, to address that question. Um, I, I will say that all, you, you can anticipate all the anxieties that healthcare workers will have. You can also anticipate that healthcare workers as a class of people are incredibly dedicated and incredibly brave and courageous. That doesn't mean that at some point they're courage won't crack. And, and so the way you maintain that courage is you give them information, you train them appropriately, you provide them with whatever protective devices you can, and you make sure that you practice efficient and effective infection prevention and control procedures in healthcare settings. David is agreeing very passionately. Well, I agree. I think that you've touched on all the right points. Look, first of all, they're dedicated, but they're also better informed than the general public. So you, you're starting with an advantage. Secondly, you have responsibilities for infection prevention and control, which is uh, we're working in 80 health centers in Eastern DRC. And obviously the first priority is to make sure that the health work care workers there are properly uh, protected. Thirdly, I think it's um, easy to underestimate the importance of effective training. I mean, it sounds simple to how you put on your protective clothing, but actually that's not simple at all. And um, Associated with that, uh, fourth point and last point, and without wishing to sound like a, too technocratic about it, the management systems and the discipline associated with the routines of infection prevention are incredibly important. So the hand washing, the um, cleaning of the boots, the rigor with which you manage your systems are incredibly important because they build the culture of care that starts with the healthcare workers and then moves on to the patients. And I think if you get the basics right, you can really engage the minds and the hearts of, of your workers in an effective way. 
And if I, if I may add, um, uh, the reason why we are announcing our commitment today to frontline healthcare workers is because we want to scale up the training, the resilience building, uh, the integration of all of the healthcare workers as a community so that they can learn from each other and be connected to each other and have the respect and the recognition. So I think the more we can do that, and also training in leadership and management. So those are the five elements of our health worker innovation center so that we can do this and scale up the efforts to get them better prepared. Maybe it's just a final, final comment, Sima, to, you know, this initiative and the announcement today will reach 100 million patients. What would your message be for other companies listening? in terms of their support in this area? Come join with us, partner with us, because no one company or organization can do it alone. So I think it's gonna take multiple stakeholders to come together to really meet that 18 million gap. We know that is the theme of the World Economic Forum, obviously a very nice way to close out our panel. Um, thank you very much to all of our panelists for being here uh, today. Thank you very much for being here in the room, live streaming as well. And um, with that, we'll end the press conference. Thank you.